Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 25th running of the Virginia Film Festival. We're really happy you're here. You're the people who make the festival possible and make it work. Um, if your cell phone is on, please turn it off now. Um, we're sort of doubly blessed today because on the one hand, we've got an important film classic by an important director, Ridley Scott. And I'll just say, The Duelist's Alien, Blade Runner, uh, Someone to Watch Over Me, Thelma and Louise, Black Hawk Down, Gladiator, Matchstick Men, um, American Gangster, Prometheus, it's a long list. He's one of the most important, most creative directorial stylists of the last 40 years. Um, he's born in England, uh, came to prominence doing advertising there, along with his brother Tony Scott. And Ridley came to America first and then Tony came. And one of the things that Ridley Scott did that was very important in the movie business was at the time he came, everybody knew that there were these directors who were doing super cool ads and starting to do music videos, and everybody was sort of impressed with their mastery of technique. But what nobody really believed was that these guys could actually tell stories as well. It's one thing to, to know how to do tricks, and it's another thing to be able to tell story. And Ridley Scott was really the first person of those guys who came out of the high-tech advertising who showed that these guys, at least some of them, could also tell stories. And the reason that we're doubly blessed is after the film today, we're going to have Keith Carradine, the star here, for a little conversation and for your questions and thoughts on the movie. So thank you for being here and enjoy it. McCabe and Mrs. Miller, Emperor of the North, Thebes Like Us, Nashville, Welcome to L.A., Pretty Baby, The Long Riders, Southern Comfort, The Moderns, Ballad of the Sad Cafe, Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle, Wild Bill. Um, let me try to put this career in context. You know, most of us think that modern independent film started in the 1990s with sex lies and videotape and Pulp Fiction. In fact, Modern independent film really begins with John Cassavetes and Robert Altman and Alan Rudolph and the Cone Brothers and Spike Lee before that. And in that history of modern independent film, there is no more important actor than Keith Carradine. Uh, we're very happy to have him with us, Keith Carradine. Few questions and then we'll open it up to you. I should also mention that he's a Golden Globe and Academy Award winning songwriter, uh, known to many of you as Wild Bill Hickok on Deadwood, and also has had a uh, comes from an illustrious acting family. Um, as a lot of you know, uh, the son of John Carradine, the brother of Robert and Christopher, the half brother of David and Bruce, the father of one of the best actresses of her generation, Martha Plimpton. Uh, received a Tony nomination for Will Rogers Follies. Um, the list goes on. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Let's, let's start with the acting. Before we get into the specifics of this movie, and you know, it's interesting, you've worked with Robert Altman, Ridley Scott, Robert Aldrich, Alan Rudolph, Walter Hill, really important directors, and one of the things I've wondered is, how did, how did they work with you as an actor, and what do you want from a director when you're acting? Uh, <laughs> what I want is for them to make me better. <laughs> um, and uh, not, not every director is going to uh, be that hands-on. Um, one of the most hands-on directors with whom I ever worked was Louis Maul, in terms of adding immeasurably to how I thought about what I was doing. Uh, one of the least hands-on in terms of working with an actor in that way was Robert Altman, who was notorious for casting um, essence. And if he felt that he, you had the right essence for a role, he would put you in that role and then walk away and <laughs> leave it to you, which was his own kind of genius, I suppose. Uh, I, uh, Ballad of the Sad Cafe was a... a, a a very memorable experience because I was working with uh, Simon Callow, 
who was a fabulous actor in his own right and, and writer, and this was the first film he directed. But coming to it from an actor's perspective, he was able to add layer upon layer to what I was already uh, thinking about the role. So um, it, it's hard to say that there are so many different kinds of directors with whom I've had the chance to work. And uh, um, I have no complaints. I mean, I, I'm, I consider myself a very fortunate man in, in that way. Um, and some actors, some, some directors, uh, I, I thought uh, made my work much better, and some directors made by made my work better by leaving me alone. I suppose. So. Um, in watching this particular film, a lot of us would assume, maybe incorrectly, that sort of your way of working and Harvey Keitel's might be very different in terms of your training and your acting style. So, what was it like working with Keitel on this? Well, I, I can't imagine a, a more perfect uh, juxtaposition of acting approaches than mine and Harvey's for that film and what it brought to uh, the, the tension between the two characters. Uh, um, Harvey's uh, he's an actor studio guy, um, the sort of method, I guess, but uh, I'm not sure what that means, really. I mean, people talk about the method, and I understand the concept of it, but... Uh, from what I, I'm not a method actor. I haven't studied in that way. Um, but from what I understand, it really comes down to finding your own uh, approach, your own, uh, your own method. Really, it's it's a very personal approach. Um, and Harvey, Harvey could be um, very uh, demanding in terms of uh, the specificity that that he would be looking for. Um, and I tend to be more instinctive in my approach. So, uh, I, I, we, I'm Harvey and I. By the way, just so everyone understands this, we are still great friends. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, when my wife and I go to New York, we spend uh, evenings with Harvey and his wife, and, and uh, he's just a delightful guy. And uh, I might add that he's mellowed considerably. <laughs> uh, uh, at the time we were doing the film. Uh, we would have discussions about, you know, uh, it, it's interesting because I, I haven't sat and, wa and watched this film, certainly not on the big screen in many, many years. And uh, I, I was uh, I was quite relieved <laughs> to sit here and watch it with all of you because uh, I, I, found it, I, find, I found myself not cringing nearly as often as I expected I would. Uh, but I remember uh, at the time making a conscious effort uh, as a, as a an American actor and having grown up in California, albeit the son of a Shakespearean actor, but nonetheless a California boy, and uh, with with whatever my speech patterns and uh, natural accents are, um, I, I endeavored to leaven that with a sort of a, a, a mid-Atlantic kind of approach to how I spoke in the film. Um, I've been taken to task for this, by the way, over the years by a number of critics who complained about my not having put on a thumping British accent with which to play the role because I was, after all, surrounded by all of these Brits. And in looking at it now, I, I think that might have been um, a, a, a smarter choice, but I did what I did. And I can tell you that at the time, Harvey and I would have discussions about this, and he would say, what are you doing trying to speak differently from this? Just talk the way you talk. And Harvey is, of course, from Brooklyn. So <laughs> one hears that. And, 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 you know, the convention is that you know, when one is doing period film, it's rather an accepted convention that everyone has to speak with a sort of British accent, because otherwise you don't sound period. You know, I'm not sure how that became the accepted norm, but it is. However, in this particular context, I thought that the different accents worked really well, uh, because after all, one of, the, one of the premises of the story is the difference in background between these two characters and the history of, of Napoleon and him having opened up the ranks <coughs> Of, of officers to common-born people. Um, prior to Napoleon, you couldn't be an officer in, in the French army if you weren't of uh, noble birth. You had to have a noble lineage to be able to be in the officer corps. So the, 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 the real source of the antipathy between Harvey's, Harvey's and my character was the fact that I was of, of noble, I was a blue blood, and he was a peasant. And, and as, a, as a peasant, having risen through the ranks, he bore an incalculable resentment towards me and all those of my ilk. 
And that was a great source of the enmity between those two characters. So in a funny way, the, the difference in accents speaks to that. Right. And uh, um, I would say to the critic who complains about those sorts of things, uh, uh, look into the history a little more deeply and you might see that it's, it, it works rather well. That was a really long answer. Acting <laughs> shot. <laughs> One more thing about your, your acting. You mentioned period, and you've done a number of movies that are period, at least, mm -hmm. even if they're only early 20th century. And so when you're doing, and this is a true story, this film, by the way. Uh, Conrad wrote a short story, but the short story is based on a true story, and the true story ended just the way this one did. Um, do you do, like to do a lot of research when you're doing period stuff, or is that not helpful? No, I, it's very helpful. I, I, I love the research uh, when, when it is dealing with a, a, an era in which I'm not familiar and, and in which you know, I didn't grow up. Uh, um, so the research on this film was, uh, there was uh, plenty of it to be had, and, and uh, all of the filmmakers and Ridley's entire team had, had done their homework in that regard. So there was a great deal made available to us, and, and a lot of which I just spoke about in terms of the history of uh, the social history of, of, of the army and how that works. So, so that we understood who these people were and, and why we were behaving the way we were. Um, when I played uh, when I played Hickok for uh, Walter Hill in Deadwood, uh, Walter handed me stacks of stuff that was really valuable because it gave me a lot of insight in terms of historical, whatever was actual knowledge about Hickok and things that people had written about him. So yeah, it, 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 especially if you're playing someone from a specific era, or if you're playing someone who, who actually lived, if you're playing a, 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 a not a fictional character, that, that can be really useful. Um, it, it, one of the scenes and aspects of this that always intrigued me was, you're the hero, you're the protagonist, the one we're rooting for, and throughout the movie you're afraid. You know, and it's it's really interesting. I mean, I remember as a kid seeing that moment in High Noon when Gary Cooper cries and like, how can the hero cry? And here's the hero of this movie. And to me, this was partly emblematic of the new kind of film that was coming out with this, where heroes can be afraid. Um, and I was wondering sort of how you thought of your character. You mentioned his class nature, but also these questions of honor and fear. Yeah. Um, that was certainly, uh, I mean, all of, all of those things were things that, that, that I thought about in, in, in you know, approaching the character. The idea that uh, someone who came from uh, nobility, um, who came from uh, the upper class, and therefore, as was the case in that time, had access to uh, a level of education, um, um, development of certain uh, social refinements, um, all of these things that, that, that would be considered uh, uh, the making of a more civilized person. And uh, so all of those aspects were things that I thought about in terms of uh, dealing as a, as a character with any given, given circumstance into which uh, my character was, was thrust. Um, how would uh, a man of refinement and intelligence and education feel about this sort of brutishness with which he was being confronted? And uh, uh, I thought that had a lot to do with, with really the core of the story. It was about this, this, this confrontation between these two sort of life views. It, 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 it's also fascinating that the nobleman is more capable of letting go of a rigid code of honor, and it's the the, the parvenu who's working his way up who's more wet, wedded to this rigid code of honor. Uh, was ever thus. Well, open up. I've got to ask you the obvious question that that I've read. I don't know if it's true. In the scene where you are proposing to your wife, <laughs> yeah. is she laughing because your horse has a gigantic erection? <laughs> is that the reason she is laughing in that scene? Uh, there is, in fact, a, 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 yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> we do our homework at the Virginia Film Festival. Are you sure did? I, uh, no, in fact, the French are notorious for not cutting their horses. They, they, don't, they don't geld their stallions. And every horse that I rode in that movie that was a male was a stud. Um, and uh, that, that, that fabulous chestnut that I was on in the, in the horseback saber duel was a, was a stud. That was a stud horse who was... Um, 
rather unmanageable. <laughs> and, and, and those horses that uh, Christina and I had, uh, they were, there was a, a mare and a stud, and the mare was uh, in season. <laughs> so, uh, you know, unbeknownst to us, I mean, no one bothered to tell us this, so as we led the horses together, uh, the stud, which was my horse, began to get excited. And, uh, of course, I didn't see this. I was trying to play this scene with Christina, who could see over my shoulder what was happening. Uh, it made for a very charming proposal. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, you, some of you have questions. Let's open it up to the audience. Yes, ma'am. The, the question was, are you actually left-handed? Did you ride left-handed and did you duel left-handed in this movie? Well, I dueled right-handed. I'm somewhat ambidextrous. I am left-handed. I do write left-handed naturally. I, I, I draw and paint left-handed. I eat left-handed. Unless I'm eating with chopsticks, then I eat right-handed. <laughs> uh, but this was one of the things that actually did make me cringe when I watched the film. Because I thought, you fool. There was no man who wrote with his left hand in, in, in the early 1800s in France. I mean, it was, you know, that was, you were trained away from that. And had I properly done my homework, and had I been paying attention, I would have made sure that I used my right hand for those things. Um, it was a mistake. And I think it ruined the movie for a lot of us. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I've seen this movie, and I've not read Conrad's story, but I'm aware that he's a literary ironist, but a lot of his other stuff. Do you think the story is funny in any fundamental way, or do you think that we're sort of, we meaning the 20th, 21st century audience, are sort of thrown away from the screen and are laughing at things that we shouldn't be? The question was, Conrad's an ironist, is there actually humor in this? Or are we laughing at it from a 21st century perspective, but it wasn't in fact and wasn't intended to be humorous? Uh, well, I, I think that, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's full of irony. And I think that that was one of the things that Conrad was speaking to, was the, 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 the absurdity of the circumstance and the notion of this, this fight being carried on for over many years for a, a, a seemingly indiscernible slight. Uh, it, it, it's absurd. I mean, the whole thing, is, and in fact, you know, when Ridley first approached me with the film, um, you know, I've learned something since then. Um, uh, but when he first approached me, I, I kind of didn't respond to the material because I thought, who cares about these two guys that just want to kill each other over and over again? Like, What's the point? Besides that, at the time Ridley came to me, I was on the road with my band and I was having a great time being a, a, a one-hit wonder. And uh, 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 I, I, was, I was having fun playing music in clubs, you know, and I don't oh, know, I want to go to this, you know. But yes, there, there was obviously, uh, I think what Conrad, I think what drew him to the story, I mean, he came across this, this was in a pamphlet from the period, this actual story had been written down in a pamphlet at the time that uh, Conrad came across and then fleshed out into a, the short story that he finally put it in one of his collections. Um, and in fact, where we shot in, in Sarlat, in the Dordogne region of France, the first night we were all there, we assembled at the mairie of the, of the, of the village, and uh, there was a portrait on the wall, a giant portrait of a hussar in uniform, and uh, he was actually from the town. Um, and and uh, that was Harvey's character. And Harvey's character in this film was from Sarlat, where we shot the movie. None of us knew this until we got there. I think we, I think we may be out of time. Uh, Is that right? No, we've got a few more girl things. Oh. Uh, yes, sir. Um, could you elaborate for a minute on your comment that Louis Ma was a very hands-on director and, and how that affected your uh, approach to the role and the performance in Pretty Baby? Uh, the question was, would you elaborate on Louis Ma as a hands-on director and what that was like working on Pretty Baby? Yes, you know, it's interesting because uh, when, when Louis first cast me in, in the film, uh, we, we got to New Orleans to film and uh, and uh, we we had a, a session uh, uh, where we went uh, we went over his ideas about the character and and uh, specific facets of the character that he wanted to be sure we brought out and that I brought out as an actor. Um, and uh, I wish I had the list with me now. Um, 
I, I've long since lost it. But it, it, it was a series, uh, a list of 15 or 20 specific notations that he handed me that he wanted me to have in my brain as I was thinking about the work. Um, so in that way, yes, very specific um, in that regard. Um, uh, he, he, was a, uh, he was a meticulous director in that way. I miss him. Great guy. Speaking of this, this whole topic, we've talked about directors and their impact. Are there specific examples of actors where you feel they made your performance much better than it would have been? And I'm sure you've had the experience of dealing with actors where it was difficult. The actors making my work better? Yes. As, where, not the director, the actors. The actors working with you oh making my. performance. Some um, specific. Uh, you know, uh, difficult actors. Um, are difficult. <laughs> uh, my father once said that, you know, temperament, and this is one of the lessons he gave me, he said that temperament on, at work is nothing more than bad manners. And uh, I've never forgotten that. Um, I've worked with actors who've made my work better because they're so good. And when you're standing opposite someone who refuses to allow you to be false and to not be truthful in what you're doing, um, then you will, you will be better. Um, actors who might be somewhat more self-involved, um, I've, I've had very few occasions when I've had to deal with that kind of eccentricity, I'll call it. Um, but I've had to deal with it uh, once or twice, and that, uh, that doesn't help anybody. Uh, that makes everyone's life more difficult, except for theirs, interestingly enough. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes, sir. My question was about the accents, and you answered it because I thought that was real successful. Um, what about the wielding those sabers in some of the fights? It, it looks kind of dangerous. Well, <laughs> they did it so well. I know the camera was working for you, but it, it looked heavy. And the question was, were the sabers heavy? Was it dangerous? I'd heard actually that there were also batteries to create sparks yeah, in some spark of the guns. scenes. Yes. And this film, by the way, is famous for having what's considered to be truly authentic dueling scenes. Um, a lot of people have said you have to go back to Basil Rathbone you know, in the Robin Hood movie to find swordplay that's as good and as authentic as this. So. Yes, uh, the, the, the sabers were heavy. They had designed some lightweight sabers for us to use, uh, which we found uh, didn't really serve because they were so light that there was no heft to them as you, as you made the moves that you were required to make it, and it didn't look right. It looked fake. And uh, so we, we opted for using the real sabers, which weigh about 12 pounds each. So that that added a great deal. There was, and it was uh, it was certainly dangerous. And yes, the authenticity of the of the duels, the style of fighting. Bill Hobbs, the brilliant fight director, who had who had also uh, directed uh, Polanski's version of the Scottish play uh, with John Finch. Um, that was the first time I saw that spark effect used was in was in that film, Polanski's <laughs> film. But it it it, it uh, involved uh, putting a. a a chicken wire mesh along the wall, disguising it, hooking it up to a 12 volt battery, and hooking the sword up, and by you with a wire up your arm and down your leg, and also connected to the battery, so that when the sword would hit the chicken wire, it would arc and create that spark. Now, of course, occasionally, if you mishandled the sword and wound up with your thumb or finger on a metal part of the sword, you'd get a jolt. But they, yes, they were dangerous, and in fact, in that in that barn fight, the huge knockdown drag out. Uh, there's a moment where I, I clip to Harvey's thumb, and you can see him take his hand, and, and it winds up to the side, and, and he wound up with a black nail from that. Uh, it was, yeah, there, there were, you know, there was the possibility for mishap. Yeah. Also, that fight took us three days. It was supposed to be two, but the first day's work, uh, uh, the film cans, which were being shipped to uh, England for uh, processing, uh, were opened by French customs. <laughs> uh, they just wanted to teach us a little lesson. <laughs> the, uh, the enmity between the French and the English uh, stands to this day. And, uh, we had to reshoot that day. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I noticed uh, a lot of the you know shots of the film. Obviously, Ridley Scott's a really visual director, and he created a lot of just really you know spectacular you know compositions against which. 
the performances were set with these you know, magnificent landscapes. And I just want to know, did he do a lot of explaining sort of how he was setting up the shots and like, you know, sort of uh, uh, telling you what role, you know, the shots that he was creating was serving in the movie? Or did he just sort of let you do your own thing? Uh, Ridley Scott, the, the, the question was Ridley Scott in this film and in all his films is famous for the composition of the images and how spectacular and beautiful they can be. And the question was, did he talk to the actors and you about that, about what he was trying to accomplish visually in the scene, or did he just have you sort of go about your work and he would do what he did? I don't recall Ridley uh, spending a lot of time explaining to us uh, um, what he was doing visually, although on one occasion, the pistol duel at the end, that shot where you see Harvey and I against that wall and the wall is at an angle, so we can't see one another. And I do recall a, a, an over two-hour discussion between Harvey and Ridley about that. <laughs> <laughs> While I stood at the front, at the, we had a little bonfire going, and I had my feet against the fire to keep them from freezing, because it was really cold, and we were wearing these period boots with very thin soles. And I remember that Harvey was concerned that that wasn't going to work visually. <laughs> As I said, we're still really good friends. <laughs> right. Um, yes, ma'am. Your career, which is wonderful, has been so varied, and, and I sometimes wonder how you pick the roles, and I think it's interesting that you, um, when you were answering the other questions, said at first you didn't really care about these two characters, so why did you take the role? <laughs> the, the question was, why did you take this role, and given the variety of roles that you've played, how do you decide what you're going to do? Okay, I'm going to tell you the truth, <laughs> which might be dangerous. But it was uh, my third or fourth conversation with Ridley. I was, uh, I think, I was playing, uh, I was playing the Park West in Chicago, and uh, I got this phone call from Ridley saying, you know, we met and we'd spoken, we'd spoken several times, and I kept saying, ah, well, I don't know. Ah. And Ridley called and said, Keith, so you want to do the film? And I said, I don't know, Ridley. He said, Listen, Keith. We are shooting in the Dordogne region of France. And I said, yeah. He said, think of the food. <laughs> it's, it, that's all your roles? We can find out gastronomic Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like, you know, I, I feel like I'm becoming, uh, I wish, Michael Caine, you know, who says, that, well, uh, do I have to get wet? And, and does it shoot at night? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, I, I have tried to. I've tried to go into different areas uh, because that's. I feel that those are where I. That's where I learn stuff. You know, if you can place me in a in an environment that is different. Um, I, 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 I'm trying not to repeat myself. Um, I'm not sure that's possible, but uh, but. That's all I've ever tried to do was something I haven't already done. So that really is largely behind the choices I made. And, and in fact, um, I have no regrets. Um, um, I, I, I'm, I've had a, a really, really different kind of career. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly happy about that. You know, in terms of the variety uh, and the, the quality of characters you've played, um, one of the things you've talked about in the past is, is that there were real hardships in your childhood. And I'm wondering, do you think that sort of the emotional depth that you go to is linked to childhood experiences, or do you not see think of those kinds of connections as relevant? I think it's all relevant. I think every actor uses their entire ex life experience in what they do, so I'm certainly no exception in that regard. Yeah, all of that feeds into what one is doing and, and one's own personal ability to access those things that are inside of all of us. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to be able to access them. And then, obviously, on top of that, the craft comes, I suppose, in your ability to do that while at the same time uh, presenting uh, a veneer that, that, that might be quite different from who you are in everyday life. I mean, and there are those actors who are brilliant at it. Um, I've never been that kind of an actor. Uh, but but, but I, I try to at least always be truthful. And, and uh, where I can, 
seem as though I'm actually from the time and place that, 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 that I'm being asked to. All right. Well, um, okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, those costumes. What was it like? And could people really fight wearing some of those? Some of that. The, the the question was about the costumes and what was it like wearing those? And could you really fight in them? And let me just add to the question: Does putting on the costume significantly affect getting into the characters? It does for some actors. It, it does. It, it does me absolutely. I'm very much an outside-in actor. Um, I. I, I feel where I am, what I'm wearing, all of that adds immeasurably to how I feel about you know, what I'm playing. Uh, the costumes, yes, they, they were difficult. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, when we first got our costumes, they were actually made from authentic materials that were as closely as possible replicated the materials at the time. And we had to change to modern fabrics because the fabrics from that period wouldn't give. So, you know, you, you make a thrust with a saber and your pants would split. Um, we, we, had to, we had to make adjustments like that. In terms of how people fought wearing that stuff, I don't know. I mean, uh, it was obviously, uh, there was this romantic idea attached to the warrior's life, to the soldier's life. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, many, many far more educated people on the subject have, have written and spoken to this, uh, the end of the romantic area of the notion of war as being this great romantic endeavor. No, it's, it's brutal, it's hell, and it's folly. Um, but uh, the Napoleonic Wars were certainly, that was before the end of it all, which was, I suppose, World War I, right. destroyed everyone's notions of that. Um, I don't know how these guys, I mean, you know, they, 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 it was a different approach to fighting in those days. Obviously, the hand-to-hand -hand combat that Harvey and I were um, doing in the, in the film was, was very different from what most wars were very organized, regimented, lines of soldiers uh, on horseback. Uh, so it was sort of the, the clothes worked in terms of the, the way things were, the, the way wars were actually fought. As things got looser and, uh, and guerrilla warfare, you know, came into play, and I think kind of that began with our revolutionary war, right. day, didn't it? Um, then uh, it became more practical to dress <laughs> comfortably. <laughs> Keith Carradine, one of the great American actors. Thank you for the